All right, so you guys, if you have a Bible, open it up to the book of Acts. If you don't have a Bible, Tom, can you raise your hand in the back there by the basketball hoop? There's a couple giveaway Bibles um, because I want you to follow with me and trust me that I'm teaching from the Bible. And you'll trust me best if you can actually see it with your own eyes. Some of them will be put up here. We're going to talk about how to go and how to let go. By let go, we're not talking about letting go of your past, all that stuff. We're not going to get into that kind of psychology stuff. We're going to get into how we, as people, um, are commissioned and sent out, and then how um, we send as a church. So, a um, little bottleneck there. The kids are talking through things. It's kind of got a nice coffee house feel, right? There's noises going on while you're trying to do your thing. All right, so we're going to look at the book of Acts, chapter 13. I really like this passage um, a lot. Chapter 13, 14, some overview on it, and then um, we'll nail down some of the points that I was talking about. So everyone got a Bible? Everyone with me? Acts chapter 13? Okay. So um, how to go and how to... Let go as a community. So let's, in fact, let me just read the first five verses and then um, we'll come back. Now there were in the church, this is uh, Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manahan, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid hands, their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had John to assist them. And then we're going to skip to the end um, uh, at some point. Maybe I'll just read it now. Um, so if you come full circle, this is uh, the church sending out the first, what we would say, missionaries, or the first endeavor, intentional endeavor by the church to send people out to preach the gospel. Now, it had been happening, but it had been happening through persecution. This is the first time they kind of got the jump on Satan on that, because God was allowing Satan and that persecution to drive them out, because in their comfort, they were getting really sedentary, and not going out and doing what God had called them to do. And so they would really have rather just to remain together just in a nice little cloistered group and arms around each other and sing Kumbaya, the Titanic sinks or whatever. But God wanted them to go out. So they got ahead of that this time. The Holy Spirit led them to actually send these men out to be missionaries, to preach the gospel. So this was the first time they send them out, and then they come back, and it looked like this. When, so they actually would have gone south from where they were to the coast a little bit, caught a boat over to Cyprus, crossed Cyprus, doing missionary work, then take a boat up into southern, what is southern central Turkey, um, and then began preaching and hooking kind of a right up into the interior of what was, at that time was called Asia, but more central Turkey to us now. And then they reached an end and turned around and went through those cities again, uh, strengthening them, and then came back home. So full circuit. That's what I love in these two chapters. You see the full circle. Um, there's a lot more in there that I'm not going to um, deep dive into. If you want that, you can go to the, the teaching from Friday where I went through both of these chapters. But in chapter uh, 21, it says, when, of chapter 14, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made uh, many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, this is them backtracking now, and to Antioch. Here's what they did, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. I like how they, it's like, you know, they didn't sugarcoat this whole gospel thing. They gave them the gospel and then said, look, it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders, so they set up some structure in the church for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And then they passed through their continuing their journey back home. 
through Pisidia, came to Pamphylia down on the coast. When they spoke the, close to the coast, when they spoke the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia, which is the coastal city. There, from there, they sailed to Antioch, which is their home, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had notice this fulfilled. They completed a job. They had a mission. They went out and they completed it and they came home. And then, look at this, verse 27, and when they arrived and gathered the whole church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. So there's the debrief. Full circle, right? And, and what I want you to see, and then they remained no little time with the disciples, so they remained there. Now, this is Paul's first, what we call Paul's first missionary journey. But what I love was the culture from which this came, the way that the church actually sent them out and then received them back. And, and that culture is an important thing. One of the, there's three things that I think are important, and, and many churches have very much the same thing, um, just said a little different. But for us, it's um, to connect. That is to connect you with Jesus and with each other. Those two things go side, hand in hand. You need to be connected, not just vertically, but connected to each other. That's a healthy person is when you have other Christians you can pour into and who can pour into your life. Mutual submission. We'll look at that in a minute. So connect, empower. This is the teaching of the word. Um, when I share the word or when you're alone with each other, or together in small groups, and you're empowering through the word of God. And then commissioning is the sending out. And, and commissioning happens... As in group, in, and, and particularly, probably not in a larger group like this, but in smaller groups, um, people begin to recognize your callings. You begin to use them in a public way or in some visible way, or God, rec God acknowledges those, and they can acknowledge that, affirm you in that, and in a sense, in that affirmation, commission you, send you out. That's how I believe this, this very... The simple cycle that should happen. You should get connected with the body of Christ. You should be empowered by the word of God and grow. And as you grow, God begins to unfold the gifts and the callings that he has on your life. And as that happens, the church, that would be us, should begin to recognize the abilities and the giftings that God has, ha has on you. And we should be able to lay hands on that and enter in with that, to take part of that, to say, we own that, and we're going to support you in this endeavor, whatever it is. And that should happen, not just with a few people in the church, but ultimately the whole church network should be held together by that kind of community. So let's take a look at this. First of all, there's, there's um, some things I want you to look at back in chapter 13, the beginning of this. So let's just walk through some of this. So now it says in, in chapter 13, verse 1, now, there were in the church at Antioch. Remember, this was the first Gentile church. This was a purely Gentile church. But by formation, there would have been Jews in it, perhaps. But it was Gentiles that had gone. Now, just as Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And this is beginning to happen here. And so in this church, God is raising up leaders. And it says, at that church were prophets, that is, people who speak the word of God powerfully and teachers who explain it. And here's who they were. Barnabas, who we've always already met, right? A good man. And Luke talks at length about him. Simeon, who was called Niger. This would mean he was more than likely a black African man. Lucius of Cyrene, that would be Libya, another African man, North African. Manan, a member of the court of Herod. One of the version translations says that he was a friend, a lifelong friend of Herod. Interesting. In this church, and then, of course, Saul, who was part of this, who later in this, whole pa in this passage, he will begin to be called Paul and never go back to Saul. Paul means little. I think it was Paul's way of reminding himself that no matter how greatly God used him, he was nothing. He was just a man, just a little man that God used. Paul later in his life would say, I'm the chief. He would, go, he would progress in this. I'm I'm a sinner, I'm, I'm a bad sinner, and then ultimately, I'm the chief of sinners. He ultimately re recognized he was less and less, but God was greater and greater doing these amazing things through him. So these were the people there, but check this out. First of all, I want you to look at the environment in which this church raised up people to send out. The environment. So the environment was this. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, 
the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. There's three things in that I think are just, just obvious takeaways from this. There, that first of all, it was an environment of worship. The word we get from that actually is liturgy. It has to do with serving the people, but it says that they were actually serving God. Now, when was the last time you came to church and thought, I'm going to go to church and serve God? I'm going to go minister to God, do something that makes God happy. Because honestly, if I, I could ask each one of you individually, more than likely your motives or your reasons were probably a little different than that. You were like, I need something, or I want to meet someone, or I want to be fed. I want something to happen to me. I want to, when I'm singing those songs, I want to feel something from God. We're not thinking, God, I want to just worship you, just to adore you, just to say, God, how great you are, how amazing you are, to do something that actually just gives God glory and honor and power and praise that exalts him. And this is what the church was known for, and this is what they were in the midst of doing, was worshiping God, serving God, doing stuff that pleased God, not works. Not sacrifices, because none of that stuff is what brings God closer to us. The thing that brings God glory is us simply giving him glory and acknowledging him as who he is, as God, my Savior. I love that song that says, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. To thee all the follies of sin I resign. I love thee for wearing a thorn on thy crown. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. That's a simple act of worshiping God. Just being so thankful for what God has done in our lives. For serving him, that pleases him. That's the kind of stuff that brings God glory and makes him draw near. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. So much of the time we're waiting for God and, and, and expecting something to happen to us. You know, the priests in the temple, their job was to minister to the Lord. And this is the picture that they were ministering. They were doing the things that had to do with honoring, blessing, raising up the name of God. And so this was a church that in, by the environment was rich with real worship. Simply worshiping God, not just in a song, it, but in listening, in teaching, in serving, in everything. It was this sense of serving, pleasing God. So first of all, then, was they were worshiping the Lord. And then there was humility. It says they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Fasting always involves a humiliation of self, a bringing down of self. Often in the Bible, it says he humbled himself with sackcloth and fasting. That means he wore rough cloths, uh, clothes that were nothing special, sat even in ash heaps sometimes or put dust on their head. All of that was a way of saying, God, I'm nothing. I'm just dust. This dust I'm sprinkling on the head, it, my head is a dust to which I'm going again. I came from dust. I'm going back to the dust. I recognize how little I am in my own sight. There was a humility. So in that environment of worshiping God, ministering to God, and humbling themselves before God, instead of coming in with an agenda and saying, God, you do this or I'll do this for you and, and, and we'll have this little exchange, is they came just humbly worshiping God and waiting on God. And in that position, in that environment, it became a rich environment for raising up and sending out. And so... In that environment, the Holy Spirit said, and here's the third thing, sacrifice. Because the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul. You know, that's what sacrifice is. It's when we're setting something very precious aside for God. And this was a church that was known for sacrifice because, in fact, when you first see it, it says that prophets came, said there was going to be a famine in the land, and they determined back in chapter 11 to give as they were able to support the brothers in Jerusalem and sisters in Jerusalem in their suffering. They were a sacrificial church. But they understood that the sacrifice was more than just giving their stuff. 
Because when it says here, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, do you understand that these were big players, major players, foundational players in the church that was in Antioch? And it's God is saying, I want you to give your best and your brightest to me. Instead of sending off into some missionary endeavor, some work that needs to be done, instead of sending you know, the person that you can afford to give up, you send the people that you can't afford to give up. And so here's the environment in which this happened. It was worshipful, there was humility, and there was an attitude of sacrifice, of giving up, giving sacrificially. David had that attitude, right? When he brought an offering to God, and the man said, here, you take it for free. And he said, I will not give to God that which cost me nothing. There needs to be value in the sacrifice. So the environment was worshipful, humble, and sacrificial. Secondly, what was the mindset? Now listen to this. For the work, he said, set them aside for, uh, to me for the work to which I have called them. So they were yielded. Three things. The mindset was one of being yielded. Mutual submission and a resolve. Look at how that works out here. First of all, yielded. God said, set them aside for the work to which I have called them. You know that often one of the hardest things we find in the church, whether it's as a leader, I can grab a hold of my leadership team and, and hold on to them tightly, or people who have ministries, we can hold on to those tightly. That's not a yielded hand. When a hand is clutching a ministry because you believe that this identifies you and you cannot let go of it because your identity is found in this, this is not yielding to God. Yielding to God holds those things with an open hand. This is a hard lesson I learned over a period of years in which I found myself clutching to the things that I thought defined me in the church. And if I'd held on to those things, I would have, who knows where I'd be. I'd be back remaining in, in some other area than, than where God's got me right now. I didn't seek this position, but I found myself coming to a place through difficulty and even some struggling, fighting with God, of where God showed me I have to hold on to things with an open hand. I have to hold on to the ministries I think I have because I don't own them. And notice he says here, it's the work to which I have called them. God defines you, and God defines the work to which he's called you. And you think you clutch a hold of these things because, and here's why I believe the primary reason is we believe our identity is found in those things. And our identity is not found in the things that we do. Our identity is found in Jesus Christ. Do you love Jesus? Has he transformed your life? Then that is your identity. And Christ, who, when he, who is our life, appears, then will appear with him in glory. Christ is my life. He is my identity. No matter what I'm going through, up and down, good or bad, God is my identity. And so the yieldedness says, I'm willing to let God define the terms. He says, it's a work to which I have called them. God will define it. So first of all, it's yielded. This is the mindset, one of being yielded. The second one is one of mutual submission. Now, I love how we talked about humility. Look in verse 3. It says, then after fasting and praying. They'd already been fasting and praying, and God spoke to them. But there was a humility in that that said, we don't know everything, even though God just spoke to us. So we're not going to take off running and think we understand this. So we need to pray and seek even more clarity. And seek uh, protection and seek empowering and seek clarity on how God wants to do this now. There's a humility in going through that, but this mutual submission, look, is here. And fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They were sending off Paul, the apostle, who would go on to write most of the New Testament... And Paul didn't have an authority thing and think, you know, no, I don't need your hands laid on me. I know who I am in God. I'm not called by men. But there is a mutual submission to the process of God using men and women to commission us. And wouldn't it be interesting if everyone in the church, no matter what your calling is and place in society is, that when you were transferred by your work to a new location, you presented that to the church, 
so that the church could get on board and lay hands on you and be a part of the process of sending you out. We don't even think in those terms of mutual submission, do we? We have a kind of an independence. It's like, where are you going? Well, or where did they go? I don't know. Let's you follow, give them a phone call. Oh, they moved. You know, we don't know where they're at or what's going on. We don't know if they're in a safe place. We don't even know if God let them out. They just moved. But this mutual submission says, I need you. I need you in my life. I am not independent of you. I can't live independent of you. I need you to speak into my life. And you also need me to speak into your life. And when the Holy Spirit speaks, if we're listening to him, we'll both hear the same message. And instead of you going off and plugging your ears and saying, I know what God told me and running off in a direction, you're actually hearing it from someone else who says, man, you know, God's showing me the similar thing. Now let's seek some clarity in that. So when we lay hands on you, we're entering into this thing. We're joining with you. And so the laying on of hands is a way of saying, we affirm what you're doing. We're sending you out. But it does another, it's another thing, too. It's saying, we're letting go of you. And that, you know, that can be painful. And that laying on of hands is a part of the process of sending out, recognizing and letting go. How many times I've seen people, even in the church, you know, hold on to someone who feels called or God is sending out. Maybe even tell them it's not God's will. As if we can determine God's will for that person. And really what we mean is, I don't like it. It's painful to let you go. Therefore, my will be done, not thy will be done. Mutual submission. This is a rich, valuable thing that was present in the early church. And particularly in this church. Where they recognized there was no independent living. You know, where am I preaching this message in Alaska? What are we known for? Strong, independent people, right? This is our thing. We came here to be independent, to be on our own, to be separated. And yet, that can be horrible in God's eyes because it says that you're living your life as unto yourself and instead, of, as, instead of living your life unto God. Because these people look around you are people that God loves and is appointed to you to speak into your life. Mutual submission is huge here. And then thirdly is the resolve. They laid hands on them and they sent them off. And when they went off, it wasn't like they sent them off pushing them. It's like, come on. And Paul and Barnabas are like, no, no. And pushing them out the door. They... It was more like they were holding them, holding them, holding them, and then letting go, and they were ping off in a direction. They went with resolve. And the resolve was, we have a mission to fulfill, and we're going to go, and nothing is going to get in the way. Not difficulty, not danger, not tribulation, not persecution, and in fact, you'll find in this chapter, not even death. I love this passage later on in the chapter where it says that they, these people came, they stoned Paul, they drug him out of the city and thought he was dead. And the disciples gathered around, that's in 14, 19 through 20. The disciples gathered around him and he rose up and entered the city. They knocked him down and drug him out, but he stood up and went back in. Because God had a mission for him and nothing, he was resolved, I will not stop I've got a mission to c complete, and I'm not going to stop until I've done it. And you can knock me down, and you can drag me out, but by God's grace, I'll stand back up and go back into the place that you just drug me out of and preach the message that God has given me to preach in that place. And I love the sense of purpose in that. Is what we need as men, what we need as women, is a sense of purpose in our lives. Some higher calling that's worth really living and dying for. And we're living for so much less. Think of it. What are you living for? What am I living for? First, it's to raise a family, to just 
make your trailer really nice or your bus really nice. As Lisa and I lived in a bus our first few years. And, and then it's a, an apartment, a rental, and then it's a house. And, and now you own this place and you're pouring your life and your time into it and you're working toward your retirement and then you're working toward, you know, whatever happens after that. But you, no one spends time, the same amount of time, building into their eternal retirement and living for eternal things. And so in a sense, we're really not building on a firm foundation if we're not building on Jesus Christ. He's not central to everything we do. The resolve is that Paul has is a resolve of, hey, if I never have any of those things, this one thing I do. This is what he says in Philippians, right? You remember that. In the book of Philippians, he says, I, I count everything loss. I, I want to know Jesus, to know Christ my Lord for his sake. I suffered the loss of all things. I count it all as trash, rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He goes on in verse 12 of chapter 3 of Philippians to say, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do. See, everything in Paul's life was narrowed down to one thing. And you know, the problem with our lives is they're too complicated. It's not one thing, it's many things. Jesus said to Martha, 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 you're mindful and troubled over many things, but Mary is doing the one thing that really counts. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning of Jesus. It's the one thing, the one thing, and there's a resolve when God calls us and sets us to a work, and there's a sense of purpose in our lives. As we move towards that. So there's purpose. There's resolve. So the mindset is yielded, mutually submissive, and resolved. And then the mission. Look at this. Verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that it says that the church, the Holy Spirit said to the church, set them aside. In other words, he entrusted the church. He set them aside um, for the work that I've called them to. They fasted. They prayed. The church did that. The church laid hands on them. The church sent them out. But the next verse, it says, being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Did you know that the work of the church commissioning men and women into ministry is a holy work and is the work of the Holy Spirit? Then indeed you could actually say after the church has sent them out that they're sent out not by the church but by the Holy Spirit himself. Well, if we have the mind of Christ, if we're listening to what God says and in step with that, if we're worshiping, if we have that environment of worship and humility and sacrifice and God speaks into that, and then we can send out, and we can do that well. And that person can actually say, I was sent by the Holy Spirit. And so they were sent by the Holy Spirit, but look what they did. They went down to begin their work to Seleucia. From there, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, the first place on their missionary journey, what did they do? They proclaimed the word of God. They proclaimed the word of God. So was that a one-time thing? Well, let's just take a look. Look at verse uh, 7. At the end of that verse, it says that uh, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence on the island, summoned Barnabas and Paul, and he sought to hear what? The word of God. And then a man gets in the way between Sergius Paulus and the word of God, and Paul has to actually strike him with blindness, tell God to strike him with blindness, because he's a mountain in the way of accomplishing God's work. And he says to the mountain, in a sense, be removed and cast into the sea, and it happens, because God has a mission for him to accomplish, and that guy was in the way of it. And then the proconsul, verse 12, believed when he saw it occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And then Paul goes to the, the next place. They get to the synagogue. They read the word of God. And they say, if you have anything to say, say. And he stood up and he gave them a word of exhortation. Verse 15, which is basically preaching Jesus from the word of God, from the Old Testament and the New Testament. That whole next passage is about Jesus and how it hit that the word of God was actually fulfilled even in those who rejected the word of God. They accomplished it by rejecting and killing Jesus. They actually accomplished the will of God. And Paul calls it in verse 26, the message of salvation. And he says that he accomplished all that was written of him. And then in 
32, he says, we bring you the good news, the gospel, as it is written, he has spoken. These are all speaking of the word of God. This was the same message. He had one string on his guitar, and it was the word of God, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. So many people are into it. this life hacker, that life hacker, this guru, that guru, or this person that can help them on their way. And Paul brings it just down to a very simple thing. It's the gospel. The gospel means the good news. And Paul said, of the gospel, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto righteousness for everyone who believes. So he had a message, and the message was the gospel. And you know, the message of the gospel is not just a message for Paul or for me or for maybe a couple of people in the church to proclaim the message of the gospel is the message that you or I or any Christian has for the world that is hurting and lost and in bondage to sin and can't get out of it. The message is the message of the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus came to die for sinners. He came to set free those who are bound. And that's what all the Old Testament is about, is a message of, a, of, a, of the Messiah, the coming one who would come and set us free and make things right. He preaches the gospel. In verse 40, he speaks of what God said in the prophets. He quotes them throughout there. Then in verse 42 or 43, he encourages them to continue in the grace of God. The word of grace is the gospel. In verse 44, the next week, the, the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Verse 46, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you, Paul says. Verse 48, the word of the Lord, um, they believed and were glorifying the word of the Lord as many were appointed to eternal life believed. And verse 49, the word of the Lord was spreading through the whole region. Do you get the idea that maybe Paul's mission was to simply preach the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ and nothing else? Paul says in one place, I determined to know nothing else among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, I could have told you a lot of things. I could have gone on to some really deep teachings. I could have shared experiences that I experienced on this trip when I got stoned to death and went into heaven. But I determined to preach nothing other than Jesus Christ and whom crucified. Why? Because that's the power. That's really what it all comes down to. And do you know Satan's deception is to add and to add, and to add, and to add, until one thing becomes many things, until we've forgotten the one thing, and we're just doing the many things. But it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Chapter 14, they spoke in such a way that great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Verse 3, chapter 14, the word of his grace, he told them to uh, they bear witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Verse 7 of chapter 14, they continued to preach the gospel. It was just this message over and over and over again. So they were commissioned. They were sent out by this warm community, which would have been much happier, safer, just to stay there and enjoy the worship, enjoy the fellowship and the richness of that. But God commissioned them and sent them out. And the church sacrificed. They gave their very best. You know, it's, it's worth a note that the very best may not look the, like the most prominent. They may not be the most visible. You know, we have people among you, a little family right here, who spent their money, their life, ministering here, working here, saving money, going to Nicaragua on their own dime every year for many, many years. Until at some point we woke up and went, hey, we should probably come alongside them and help them out, see what we can do. They're great men and women of the faith. They're just willing to serve in that simple way. And we as a church get to be part of that. But not just that. That's why we do community groups. That's why we have small women's groups and things. Is what we're trying to do is get you into a place of community at a small enough scale that people can recognize you and your calling and actually be part of laying hands on you. And it doesn't have to be them physically putting hands on you. It's them affirming you, saying to you, hey, you know, I've observed this in you. I've seen this gifting in you. I've seen this calling. You do that. When you do that, you do that well. When you do that, I feel like Jesus is speaking to me. 
when you minister in that way. And I could go through the church, point to you, people that I've experienced Jesus through because they've just been a servant in whatever they're called to be. Then, the, then of course, we come down to the very end of this chapter where Paul, chapter 14, and if you look at chapter 19, it talks about Paul being stoned with rocks and dragged out of the city, supposing that he was dead. So it's in that, in that background, you know, we just skim over that, don't we? It's like, oh, yeah, he got stoned, dead. And then he went back and he's preaching. So that's just what Paul does. What if that was your experience? You know, you'd write a book about that. Paul doesn't even really talk about this. But he gets up, so they knock him down, they drag him out. He stands up and goes back into the city, spends the night there, probably strengthening the disciples, and then leaves the next day. Now, when they reach the end, which is another city over, and they turned around, they come back, and it's out of that experience that they're probably saying that they went back strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, guys, gals, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Tribulation is the word thlipsis. It means tightness, compressed. It's like going through a strait in the boat where you cannot turn around. You can't turn left or right, and the current's flowing. You just got to go for it. It's like life is like that sometimes, right? You ever have those experiences where it's like you're cruising along, and it's just all of a sudden you're like going, you, you think you're, at your, you know, walking under your own power, and pretty soon it's like, hey, I'm moving. I, I want to stop. I, I want off of this thing now. How do you get off of this conveyor belt? And it's just like more and more, it's like tribulation. But Paul says even tribulation is important, essential even in the believer's life. He says tribulation, remember the word, Romans 5, tribulation produces. Tribulation produces. Tribulation is productive in the believer's life. And that's what Paul wanted them to know. So after he preached the word of God to them, he says, now, you need to know that the word of grace is something you have to continue in, and it's a temptation to try and jump ship when things get difficult, but tribulation produces. Going through the tribulation produces perseverance, and per perseverance produces character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart through Jesus Christ. And so that's the message that he gives them, and he leaves them, and then he gives them a few leaders and they leave. And that was the beginning of multiple churches. That was an effective, successful church plant. As simple as that. We complicate these things so much, but it's such a simple thing to do. Then they come back to the community that sent them, and they share with that community. So you see, even in going out, and now finding their footing, finding a voice, seeing God use them powerfully, they don't abandon the community from which they were birthed. They come back and say, hey, you guys, in humility, look at how God used us. Look at what God did through you. And they shared that with that community that sent them. Whole circle. I love this whole picture in this. God had opened the door of faith, and then they hung out there for a time, for a long time, until they go next. And we'll see that next time around. I think that's it. Anyone uh, need to be commissioned right now? Decommissioned? <laughs> Some of you are probably feeling like you'd like to be decommissioned for a while. You've been decommissioned actually for quite a while with COVID. Now it's time to just begin to see how God would engage us. And I love the fact that you're here. You're, you're beginning to do that. We're beginning to find our stride again and see how God wants to use us as, as a church. But wouldn't it be great if we just modeled after that very simple thing of a church that was worshipful, was humble and sacrificial, and from that position we began to hear God speak to us and say, hey, we should lay hands on this person. They're gifted. And the people, the church gathers around and says, yeah, we see that too. Let's gather around. Let's send them out. Let's give them what they need to be supported in that. Let's pray for them as they go out and then welcome them back with joy.
as they give us the reports of how God's used them. Jesus did that with the disciples, remember? He sent them out, and they came back rejoicing, saying, ah, even demons are subject to us. So that's great. That's, that's really fun, but rejoice mostly because you're a born-again child of God. Your name's written in heaven. That's the best thing of all. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this church example that we have, first Gentile church, and how they got a vision early on to send their best and brightest into the world at your direction to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we have a world outside of these doors, out in our own streets, Lord. We, I saw today some of that brokenness, some of those people aching and needing you, Jesus. We have a world that needs you. So Lord, would you commission us? We just accept. We yield, Lord, to what you would want to do. We don't want to define what the work looks like. We don't want to clutch those who you're raising up, and we don't want to clutch the ministries that we think we have or the gifts we think we have. Instead, Lord, we pray that you would define it and send us out to the work which you have appointed for us, whatever that is, Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, the disciples um, were big shots because they'd been walking with Jesus for three years. God was using them. They were casting out demons. Lots of cool stuff was happening, so much so that John and James, his brother, we're talking about calling in an airstrike on a city that rejected Jesus. Jesus takes him into the upper room. He says, he, knowing that he had all power and that everything he had came from God and that he was going back to God, it says he laid aside his garments, got down on his knees, and he washed their feet. This is the very thing that we fight against, and yet that's, many of us, that's the starting point and the beginning, middle, and ending point where we'll really find fulfillments if we just can find that place of how can I serve not the greatest, not the most visible, but the least of these and do it in a way that honors God. Let's worship.